Freelancers, small business owners, consultants, and solopreneurs. Some people are just drawn to working for themselves. I'm Owen Roth. In this show, I have conversations with self-employed folks about their career journeys. Welcome to the Boss's Path Podcast. And here we go. Today, I'm joined by Mark Putz, a co-owner of the Watershed Fly Shop in Corvallis, Oregon, and also a fishing guide. Mark, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what you do? So primarily, you know, it's it's a retail job. Um, we work on getting people the right gear they need, whether it's flies, uh, leader and tippet, rods, reels, waders, uh, and then we have a pretty expansive fly tying section as well. So, you know, feathers from birds. I just work there keep the inventory right, you know, foster relationships with customers, um, and just try to be, I guess, a curator of a community. And you're also a fishing guide. Yeah, so part of the roles that all three of us share, Troy, Eli, and I, is that we we guide for the shop as well, so we don't hire external guides, the three of us guide. Um, and that basically, you know, as, as cool as it sounds, is just taking people fishing and having a good time um, from people who know exactly what they're doing and need zero instruction to people who it's their first time fishing ever, let alone fly fishing. So, yeah. So is the guide done under the same umbrella of the fly shop or is that kind of a separate thing that you sort of like, be like, oh, and we guide separately? The fly shop is Watershed Fly Shop Inc. And then the guide outfit is Watershed Fly Shop Outfitters. Uh, we all guide under Watershed Fly Shop Outfitters. Uh, and then the shop, you know, has to make sense for the shops. So the shop gets a commission from all of our guided trips, uh, and then the rest goes to whomever is guiding that day. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And do you have any employees on either side of that? Nope, just the three owners, so myself, Eli, and Troy, uh, and we kind of divvy out responsibilities. We, we meet, like, relatively quarterly and and kind of say, is this working, is this not working? You know, I think Mark would be better doing this. Eli would be better doing this. Mm. Um, and right now it's working out pretty well. Um, hopefully soon, you know, we're, we're busy enough to where we can have an employee. That would be kind of cool yeah. uh, because we are growing, which is surprising given the, the environment uh, that we're in right now economically. Um, we've had some pretty good growth this year. So, yeah. That's awesome. I want to ask you questions about the shop, but – Part of it is a, a big question is like how you got integrated there with the owner. So maybe go to the beginning and mm -hmm. we'll start with like your career leading up to the shop and then we can go more into the, the shop itself. Does sure. That sense? So uh, I guess the beginning, right, the, the, the path to entrepreneurship. Um, I So I'm from eastern Ohio, Steubenville, Ohio, which is right on the border of West Virginia and maybe 20 miles from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, and... Let's see. I guess I started – I worked as a Domino's delivery driver from 18 until, I don't know, maybe 22 or so. And, and kind of in that time, you know, being a Domino's driver, you need cars, right? Like because you're really hard on the car. Yeah. Um, you mean When you say cars, you mean like you go through cars because you burn them out or like – Yeah, I did because I didn't – you know, I didn't want to – I didn't want to be in debt for a car. So I just buy cars in cash, right? Okay. Um, and Sorry. yeah, and – in doing that, you kind of start to understand a market, right? Like this car is worth this much or with these problems, this car is worth this much. Um, and yeah, I started understanding that market and I started flipping cars, right? I'd buy it and drive it at Domino's for two or three months and then sell it and make a thousand dollars. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. And then it, it kind of clicked like, so the the wage system back home at the time it was a split wage when you were in the shop you were getting minimum wage and then when you were out of the shop we were getting like four dollars an hour or something so it kind of clicked like you know mathematically if i just flipped like a couple cars a month i'd be making the same i would be in wages mm -hmm. um and all the while i was, I was in school I was, in, I was going to college uh -huh. um so I started doing that much more often and working far less. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was actually, you know, pretty liberating, right? Like being a, I don't know, 19, 20-year-old kid and making $3,000 in a weekend, mm -hmm. just flipping two or three cars over, you know, literally over a span of a few days. Yeah. Um, it was it was pretty cool. So um, 
did that for quite some time while I was going through school. And then I started, um, again, like, you know, discovering a market, um, specific, it was a specific market for Subarus. There was these turbos that two cars shared, but when they were, came off the one car, they were less valued, even though they worked on the other car. So if you took them off of a legacy GT and then sold them for someone using them on a WRX, the value would increase. Gotcha. So I started selling turbos out of the basement of my house for quite some time. Okay. Um, and again, that generated some really cool revenue and it was like, you know, pretty easy, just driving to junkyards or whatever, verifying they worked, and then posting them online and getting rid of them. Um, Are you a car, like, a big car person? Did you know a lot about cars, the mechanics and all that? Yeah, yeah. So the Domino's thing, right, like, making $4 an hour um, kind of forced me into doing that. Like, it, you know, I needed to learn how to change my own brakes, uh, and then that went into suspension and this and that. So then, it, mm. yeah, like I, at one point in time, I was a very big car person. Was that, it sounds like bred out of necessity, not necessarily passion. A, a little bit of both. Like a, a couple of my friends were into cars back home. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely was something that we bonded over and it was, it was something to do. Yeah, if anyone's watching this from uh, Eastern Ohio, they know that there's not a lot to do. Um, <laughs> so it was something to do, something productive to do. Uh -huh. um, and, and it was a skill, right? And you know, I was able to convert the skill into into, um, into money, which was nice. Yeah. Um, nowadays, it's not. It's more of a chore nowadays when I have to work on a car. But, you know, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I was gung-ho about it. I loved doing it, you know, pulling a motor out, changing motor, whatever, taking heads off, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was all about it, but I don't look forward to it nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's interesting, though. I mean, like, some people, like like myself, you know, I like cameras and photography, something yeah. I did for fun, and then, like, I kind of went into it as a business. With you, it's with car the cars at that stage of your life, it sounds like it was kind of like, you, well, you said in your words, hybrid a little bit, but mm -hmm. it wasn't that you were, like, super into cars, and then you're like, oh, and I can use that to flip them. It was kind of, you were... You saw you just kind of stumbled upon a market via your job. And, yeah, and, yeah, I think so, right? Like my first ever car that I had was a 1989 Volkswagen Golf. Um, my mom, you know, I, I, socioeconomically I was pretty low down there. We were pretty poor. Yeah. Um, but my mom um, went halves on it with me. So I got $300 from her and then $300 of my money um, mm -hmm. and I drove that car for quite some time. Uh, and I think I ended up selling it for, you know, like 800 bucks. Right. So I generate all this revenue at Domino's that's, yeah. I used that car to get my first job there. Yeah. Um, and then sold it, still made money on selling it after all the mileage and blah, blah, blah that I put on it. Um, and yeah, we just, it just kind of snowballed from there. Right. Like, Oh, I could buy this car for a thousand dollars, drive it for two months and then sell it for $1,500. Why wouldn't I do that? Right. Yeah. It's super smart. Yeah. 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 That's a great skill to learn, especially when you're like, you know, in your early adulthood. And you're yeah. Just, right. Yeah. yeah. It was super cool to, you know, I, like I said, I think the best weekend I ever had on doing it was I made like three grand in a weekend as a 19 year old kid. Like, I, so it's actually a pretty funny story. I, I met the guy, sold it. It was a Ford Ranger, uh, sold it, had like $3,600 in my pocket. Mm-hmm with no car to get home. I met him, I met him at a store. <laughs> you so didn't think just, about that part yeah, of the plan. Yeah, I didn't think about that part. So I just was like, yeah, okay, well, I guess I'm walking home now. And I just started headed home. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it was a really cool experience to, to, to make like a decent amount of money, especially for our area. Mm -hmm. Um, basically just using like a little bit of knowledge that it had on something. And then also, you know, using a little bit of charisma, right? Like being able to talk to people and kind of understand people's situations and stuff like that definitely sure. helped as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Did you have a fleet of cars? Like were you, was there a point where you got to where you're yeah, just like, point, I have like five cars I'm juggling? Yeah. Yeah. At one point I think the max I had, um, this is including my, my girlfriend's car, my wife now, but girlfriend at the time's car, mm -hmm. uh, in our driveway, I think we had six or seven cars at one point. Wow. Um, and it kind of stayed like that. And I'd, you know, cycle out to get to cycle out two more. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I definitely had like a little fleet going on for, for a little point there. 
Um, and then I had some spillover cars parked in the volunteer fire department parking lot across the street from my house. So uh, it was interesting. Permission from them. It was more of like ask for forgiveness. I never asked for permission. I just <laughs> – I was prepared to ask for forgiveness if it came to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it never did, but yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that's super smart. Mm-hmm. As, uh, I actually toyed with doing something similar uh, back in my early 20s mm-hmm. when I was like living in New Zealand. Uh, the market there is like – at least it used to be. I mean, this is like almost 15 years ago now. But the the car market's crazy because there's like there's not any cars built in New Zealand. They're all imports. A lot of Japanese. Yeah. Um, and there and it's a super touristy place, especially for young people to go, mm-hmm. like me at the time, and just work for a little bit and like travel around and be on a, a work visa. And People just buy, and there's only one port of entry. Auckland's the only airport you can fly yeah. into. So you come into Auckland, and then, like, you go and buy a car. And, like, the used car market is just insane mm-hmm. uh, because, like, they're, like, just the demand and, and the availability yeah. is there. So I, like, bought a van, and I bought in the off season, and, you know, based on, like, it was the winter there. So I got it for a great price because people are coming up on their visas and they have to be out of the country. So some people I've heard of stories of like, you know, people like, like, Oh, my flight is in two hours and yeah. I still haven't sold this car. And someone just lowballs them at the airport because yeah. they just need to get it off, yeah. uh, get it off their hands. And that's not what I did, uh, but I did get it from someone who was like finishing up a seasonal job mm-hmm. and leaving the country. And I got a, a great deal in this van. And then I lived and traveled in that for like what, six months or something. Yeah. And then when I left the country, I left uh, during the high season, just entering summer. Mm -hmm. So I made like a, I don't remember what it was. It wasn't anything substantial, but it was like, you know, six, seven hundred dollars. Yeah, it was enough to feel like a win. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and I also got to like live and tour in it for like that six months. I also happen to have citizenship there. So I'm like, oh, I can kind of come and go as I want. And I don't have to worry about that time constraint Mm -hmm. that would force me to sell a car when I don't need to. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, I could do this and I could like buy a bunch of cars um and just like time the market get get them when the the selling season is like yeah. the prices are low at yep. the winter and then hold them and then uh sell them in the summer when yep. the floods come in but uh i didn't do it cuz i mean logistically i, I didn't want to chose not to live there right and, like doing this from abroad i thought of i toyed with the idea of like well i've got friends who live there and i could maybe like work something out where i like you know pay them and mm-hmm. they like Tend to the car, so I'm not there. But you know, yeah, then it's it gets messy when you. Yeah, exactly. It. And I was just like, you know what? No, no. But yeah. but the thought was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's interesting to hear your story. Then you did that. To yeah. A degree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it was scary spending. You know, when you had three thousand dollars in your name, spending two thousand dollars on a car. Yeah. Roughly expecting you know to make money on it, right? Like that was pretty scary, but. I did it a lot. <laughs> like it, it worked out. It ended up working out. I think my last year of college, I actually, I went from working like one or two mornings at Domino's to just not working at all. Just sold cars, and then wow. the, the car parts thing was nicer because it was just all online, right? Like oh, yeah. I would just box up a turbo and sell it, make two hundred dollars, and did that, yeah. you know, quite a bit. eBay, uh, forms, forms. Okay. The market was better on forms. You, you get more money for them on forms. So gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you have like a little studio where you take uh, photos of it and you had everything stored or was it uh, kind kitchen of just... table? Kitchen table. <laughs> yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. Whatever works. Yep. So what happens next after the the cars? My family, my, my parental figures in my family uh, definitely wanted me to finish college, right? This whole time I was in college. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I was, you know, kind of toying with the idea like, hey, do I really want to be here? Like, why am I here? Yeah, I I don't enjoy going to school. I don't particularly enjoy what I'm learning. So I had my first internship uh, at a law firm um, as like, you know, working on software development. Hmm. And um, I hated it. I I mean, I I, I used to like tell my my wife, like, I I can't do this. Like, I want to I want to quit my internship. This is terrible. You know, I was feeling really stressed out and anxious about being in a cubicle all day and yeah. and having to, you know, if, if anyone's watching this who knows me, like I kind of I have a thin filter of what I say. You know, I do have a filter. It's very thin. But like being in the corporate cubicle environment, you know, it's like you're under a microscope on what you say. Yeah. Um, and it just wasn't for me. So 
Uh, summer came around and I said, all right, well, I'm quitting this and I'm quitting school. And uh, I became an outside hire at UPS as a driver, which was it's pretty it's rare. outside hire. So contractually, I'm sure it's changed now. But at the time, it was like every seventh driver that was hired at the center came from the outside. So typically, they were all bid up. So you were a preloader, a driver spot came up, you would bid into that. It take you know takes four or five years to typically become a driver. Oh, wow. Um, I somehow became a driver at 21 off the street. Um, and frankly, you know, I, I did like it. I liked it quite a bit. Um, Mm -hmm. and it felt, it felt pretty rewarding, right? Like I was making really, really good money for the area. Um, and it was a job that kind of kept my, my brain occupied for a while, you know, then winter rolled around and, and it's peak season at UPS. Um, and that, really wasn't the problem that the volume wasn't the problem it was like just being in that metal rectangle for 12 or 14 hours in a day it's a theme here cubicles yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly square boxes and, and i i specifically remember one night um i think i had like geez over 100 stops left and it was already 5 p.m um and I met another driver in a church parking lot. It was pitch black dark. You know, we're talking like December in Ohio. Yeah. Um, and I had my headlamp on. I was going through the, the packages in the package compartment. And I was just like, you know, what? am I was I meant to do this? Right. Like, was I put on earth to do something like this? Mm-hmm. Um, and I answered the question to myself that moment. I said, no, like this, this is not for me. Um, I'm really, really glad I did it. And I'm really, really glad that, like, you know, I got to, like, experience the blue collar lifestyle um, and and do a job like that. And I felt proud of doing it, mm-hmm. um, especially at the time because, you know, my wife was going to school full time and it was it was providing for us. Mm-hmm. Um but I, I came home and I, I I told Stephanie that like I, I can't do it like I can't do it anyway I can't see myself doing this for four more years let alone twenty five years right like it's gonna it's gonna destroy my body it's gonna destroy my mind mm-hmm. um, so kind of just like that a week later I was back at West Liberty University going to school again um, and. Changed it up. I was I was in a business program that was focused in entrepreneurship, and I kind of you know started thinking again of like, hey, I want to I want to work for myself. That's that I think that makes the most sense for me because you had a taste of it in a way, right? Exactly. Prior, I had, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I had a taste of it. I mean, frankly, at the time, yeah, like the most fruitful in terms of of monetary value that I, thing that I had done for myself was working for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it kind of just kind of mold my way through. I think I was a fifth year, I guess, because that that whole six years in school, but or fifth five years in school, but six years overall because I had quit. Right. Um, so I was mulling over what I what I wanted to do, um, and kind of just biding my time through through college. Um, and I graduated school, and you know reality kind of set in like well you don't have a job and you're not going to be able to pay your bills just off of like hopes and dreams <laughs> so i scurried to find a job man and um i gosh it was a funny job i ended up getting a job with my friend um so i guess to kind of preface it eastern ohio has a huge natural gas industry going on right now mm-hmm. um and back then it might have even been bigger but with that comes a ton of natural gas Infrastructure. There's pipelines everywhere. I got a job at a landfill doing natural gas natural gas reclamation. So a lot of landfills, especially here in the Northwest, like if you went up to Coffin Butte up here, mm-hmm. you'd see these little plastic PVC pipes coming off. Yeah, um, those are drawing vacuum on the entire landfill and then bringing it to um, they they flare it off here. They just burn it off here. In Ohio, they we brought it to a processing facility that was on site, compressed it, and then put it into a, a pipeline that was, I think it was Williamson Natural Gas. Um, and then that went into a bigger pipeline. And then, you know, people were using it for electricity or for cooking or whatever. Um, Interesting. So I, I did that and 
that had to have been one of the funniest jobs I've ever done in my life. Like, it was just working at a dump, basically, right? Like, yeah. I was doing the natural gas stuff, but I was working at a dump. Yeah. Um, and you... I met some characters, man. <laughs> like, certified characters. Um, and, you know, it's kind of kind of doing that. And in the background, still in my head the whole time, I'm like, God, like, I need to find some. I need to figure, like, find a path for myself. And I don't want to do this, right? This is paying the bills. Again, it was good money for what it was. Yeah. Um, and um, at the time, I had been playing quite a bit of World of Warcraft. And I, this whole, basically the whole time since I was, like, 13 years old. I've been playing World of Warcraft. Yeah, which is an online mass multiplayer yeah. game, right? Yeah, 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 I had some friends who played that. Um, and I had friends from Oklahoma who were kind of dabbling in in the oil industry in the in the leasing side of things. Okay. Um, so how, how it works in the United States kind of varies a little bit state to state, but like in, in Oklahoma, um, there's these people they're called landmen. Um, they would approach a mineral owner. So there's there's surface rights and then there's mineral rights. Sometimes they get separated. Sometimes they stay together. Uh, in Oklahoma and Texas, it's more often that they're separated just because of how old the oil industry is in those states. Okay. Um, a landman would approach a mineral owner and essentially try to work a deal out to, to get access to their mineral rights on behalf of another company. Um, well... They were they were doing that for a pretty large oil company at the time, and you know playing video games, just talking about Sorry, it. Sorry, they being your some friends. Yeah, on, yeah, they being some of my friends online. Yep, yeah. we're we're doing that. Um, and it seemed like they kind of figured out. Well, like, hey, we can get these leases, hold them, and then package them and sell them directly to the oil companies. Not we don't have to do it on behalf of the oil companies. Gotcha. So. Um, they were doing that, and I was like, oh, well, that kind of sounds pretty interesting, right? Like, I think that's something I could do. It's kind of a little bit versed in it, right? Just f- basically, it's, it was flipping. This is, yeah, same concept. Yeah, same concept. I had my friend Dustin um, kind of take me under his wing, and, um, you know, he, he he went to law school. He had a juris doctorate, um, and he kind of explained to me all the lease terminology and what it meant and what you're looking for, Um learning plat maps, learning, you know, just essentially how to read these leases, right? How to read in section township and range and the depths and then read all the clauses. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, kind of started doing that. We started doing that as like a loose conglomerate, right? We all had our individual companies and then we funneled the leases to like an umbrella company. Um, And it worked with my other friend, Andy, on... He he's very very brilliant guy. He um, made a crawler that would go through the county courts, and then he used OCR to read current leases, find their expiry date, mm-hmm. and then we would get notified of leases that were approaching expiry dates without even have to read the courthouse, going to the courthouse to read wow, them. Okay. So in the crawler, this is a, a computer program. Yeah, essentially, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it was just uh, like a machine learning program that he that he wrote. Um, and I helped him a little bit, like on the on the user end side of things, not anything on the technical side. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it, I mean that that was what I did for a, a good while, right up until we moved out here into into Oregon. Maybe it was about five years ago now. I'm curious, is this something that you're like boots on the ground? Is that involved, or is this all like? Uh, like you're just moving paper around it. Y- yes and no, but t- typically you would be right because you would have to go to courthouses to read, you know, read the the leases. Okay, so it's not stuff you can just access. Yeah, but the courthouses in Oklahoma started scanning them, uploading them online, um, and then you know we had that the crawler going through them and looking. So it was it was pretty easy to do remote. Yeah, um, and that's what I did. And then periodically I'd go to Oklahoma and we, you know have meetings or do whatever in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it was, for the most part, it was remote. I was just had a home office. And did the structure remain the same where you kind of had this, like, loose... You, each of you and your friends are doing this not as a business together, but you're doing it kind of... Yeah, so, like, how, how it worked is we had the, the, the main company that um, Dustin and his friend 
I guess sold the leases from, mm. and then every one of uh, every one of the landman of that company had their own, you know, their own company, or it, it, you chose to have your own company, right? Like I, I had one just for structure wise, it made sense, mm. um, and yeah. So there was I don't know maybe five or six of us with, with our own companies, and then you know say Joe Schmo signed a lease with me, I would get the lease document, give it to. Um, the umbrella company, mm-hmm. and then they would pay that leasee. We would hold the lease, and then you know whomever name a big oil company, right? Yeah. Um, you would get word like, oh, they're they're starting to explore in Garvin County in Section Thirteen Town, you know, Township, blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. You would go approach their in-house landman and say, hey, um, we have a package of fifteen leases, these sections, these townships, these ranges, um, you know what do you want from them? Or like, you know, you have to buy all of them or whatever, you know, whatever. That's, that's right. how that went. Yeah. So was that you doing the, the actual approach or is that what some of what that the, was, that the was company? the, yeah, the role of the other, the, the like umbrella company, that was the role of them to do. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So you kind of stay in, in, in one lane that you're able to specialize yeah, in. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Wow. That's really fascinating. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. pretty cool. It was, um, not something I ever thought I would do. I, I kind of knew a little bit about it um, just because I was in the area of oil and gas in Ohio. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was super cool for for what it was. It was really cool. Yeah. yeah. A lot of reading legal documents and a lot of, like, the hard parts, right, were finding people, getting a hold of them. Because you're, you're talking about, you know, 70, 80-year-old people who live in Oklahoma who only have a landline, who have never – had any information out there in the public. Mm, um, you know, I even signed a lease with um, people who inherited some mineral, right, mineral rights. Uh, they One of them lived in Bend. The other one lived in Salem. And I'm working from a home in Ohio yeah. out of an office in Oklahoma. So um, they were all over. People were all over. So you had to, you know, you had to reading airship reports and understanding them and the divisions of the mineral rights and yeah. finding the people was probably the hardest part. Finding the people and, and you know, telling – some of these people didn't even know they had. Like, oh, yeah, hey, yeah, your uncle left you um, a 30th of his 80 acres and whatever, mm-hmm. you know, it, it has a monetary value to it. Do you want to lease it, you know? Right. Uh, and explaining the whole process to a lot of people. They yeah. they didn't even know that they had this this asset, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. So you get to play like this kind of – well, you, you do a lot of things. Yeah. It's not like you get to figure out how it works and you got that and then you have to go – yeah, I think the, 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 the yeah the detective part of it I yeah. think was the most fun to me like yeah. like hunting the people down right like okay well they there's this house they sold this house then maybe I'll call the realtor and tell the realtor and say hey you know don't give me their number but tell them we have an eight thousand dollar check waiting for them yeah, yeah. you know what I mean pass this note yeah on, pass yeah. this note on and and yeah. stuff like that like it was it was it was pretty fun like chasing people down and and you know trying to make deals happen okay so it sounds like you enjoyed it. I definitely did, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I enjoyed the people I worked with, right? Like, I, I'd grown up with them, um, you know, playing video games, whatever. We definitely had a very personal relationship with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had known them since I was maybe 13 or 14. And, and you know, to, like, start working with people who are my friends and, and yeah. have it be a tangible thing was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That was what you were doing prior to moving out to Oregon. Mm-hmm. So what, uh, what brought you out here? Yeah, so... Again, to any of the viewers out there who are watching from Eastern Ohio, um, there's not a whole lot going on out there, man. I mean, it's mm-hmm. there's a lot of of empty buildings, a lot of abandoned steel mills, joblessness, poverty, um, and yeah, you know, it was economically we were doing great. My wife was driving up to Pittsburgh, which some days is an hour, other days two or three hours, depending on traffic, to to work at UPMC. And I was working from home, um, and we we came out here to visit my brother, and we ended up eloping on the coast. Um, and at the end of it, on our trip back, it was like you know, we should just leave. Like why why are we why are we here? You know, yeah. It was beautiful out here, and we loved our time out here, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. So we we decided. 
hey, I'm working from home. I, Mark, I'm working from home, and Stephanie has a very desirable job in the, in healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, so she started looking for hospitals, and we we picked on picked Corvallis, and she got a job here, and uh, we left. We left wow. Ohio. Yeah, just packed up. We have our three just dogs. Like yeah, three dogs, a moving truck, and a Volkswagen Jetta, and we we just left. Wow. Okay. Yep. And then you made the drive across the country. Yep. And so, and your plan was, as far as income, you were going to continue doing what you were doing. Yes. And then mm-hmm. she would find a job yep. when you arrived. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Nothing lined up. No, she did get a job. Oh, she, okay. We moved out here on the context that she had a job. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I missed that. No, no, no. Uh, and nothing lined up with me. So I, yeah. I get out here. But, and but you did it. You, you were able to do some of what you were doing. Yeah. For a short, like, for a short while. And then I, when we came out here, COVID happened. And, you know, if, if, great timing. Yeah. You can even just loosely follow the oil market during COVID. I mean, shoot, in Corvallis, I was paying a dollar or something a gallon for fuel. I mean, oil futures were negative. Um, So it just, it just all stopped. Just all stopped. Um, So I did what I had to do, right, to provide. And I went back to Domino's here in Corvallis. Um, And again, it was the, protection like the context of well i'm just doing it to make income like i'm mm-hmm. not going to be here it's just it's something i have to do yeah, like you said you got to do what you got to do yeah exactly and um i decided that i might be interested in law enforcement at that point um so you know i was working at domino's and um kind of just figuring out what i wanted to do and then i started applying to some some law enforcement agencies, um, and pretty deep into the hiring process with the local sheriff's office, uh, you know, I had basically signed my, uh, my offer and I was on the very final stages of being hired. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a change of heart and I was like, you know, I, gosh, I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? I don't know. And I don't want to waste. Didn't, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right. And I didn't want to waste, I, you know, call me weird, but I didn't want to waste taxpayer money on testing out if I like this job. And I didn't want to put all this stress on, on my family by testing if I like this job. Like, you know, my wife, like I didn't want to come home and be miserable because I, I took a job that I wasn't in, invested my heart with. Right. Um, so I moved to a job at the hospital, um, kind of loosely related to working with my wife. I I got to see her like three or four times a day. Mm -hmm. I did that for about a year. Um, and when I, just before I had made that move, um, was when the, the Trump checks came in and I decided like, Hey, like I'm getting this money. I didn't do a darn thing for, so I'm just going to blow it all. (laughs) And, uh, I went to the fly shop where Troy was. Yeah. Um, and I just dumped every one of my Trump checks on, on fly fishing stuff. I taught self taught myself to fly fish that, you know, that year, the first year of COVID. Oh, you hadn't fly fish. No, before. never fly fish before. No. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is just a couple years ago. Just a couple years ago. Yeah. I'm at Domino's. The first Trump check comes in by my, all my fly fishing stuff. They liked me so much there because I kind of just did things, you know, like, the management really liked me. The the general manager and the regional manager let me kind of do whatever I wanted to do. They let me make my own schedule. Um, so, geez, I think I was fishing every single day. It was the most I've ever fished in my entire life. <laughs> Even since, like, when I was a kid in, in, in Ohio, like, it was the most I had ever fished in my entire life. Uh-huh. Um, and I started getting pretty good at it. And, um, you know, I started – because I was fishing so much, I was in the fly shop so much, and I started fostering a relationship with Troy. Yeah. Um, or he was fostering one with me or, or both. It sounds like both. Yeah, I was fishing a whole bunch, and then I got the job at the hospital, and um, that was another really funny job because it was – I don't know who designed it or why they designed it this way, but there was essentially like three hours of free time built into my eight hour day. Really? Yeah. It was amazing. It was amazing. And I guess, you know, you could probably see where this is going. Yeah. That free time was spent at the fly shop. Yeah. And I, I would just hang out at the fly shop. I'd tie flies there and just talk to Troy, talk to Eli, um, talk to customers. Like I knew that what the heck I was talking about. Yeah. Um, and, and just be a general fly on the wall there. Um, so yeah, hanging out at the fly shop and, 
Um, this is when the law enforcement thing started getting really big is like right in that time frame, right when I left Domino's and was at the fly shop. Yeah. Um, and then right after I made the decision not to pursue the law enforcement job, I had a pretty serious injury to my hip um, where I was going to have to have surgery that was going to basically take me out of work for, I think it was like four months I was out of work. Ooh. And I was in a brace, the whole thing. It was a, it was a joke. Again, where, where do you think my free time was spent? At the fly shop with Troy and Eli, yep. And, you know, I was kind of just talking to Troy about, well, like, hey, you know, I, th- I think I'm going to do this when, I, when, when I'm able to walk again. I think this is going to be what I'm going to start looking at doing and X, Y, Z. And um, he, I guess, hatched the idea that, like, hey, you know, I, I Troy, kind of, I'm at the point in my life where... I want time, right? Like, I I don't need to be at this fly shop for 50 hours a week. I don't need to be guiding, you know, 80 days a year or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I want time. I want to be with my kids. I want to be with my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, so to, to get time, he proposed that myself and Eli buy a portion of the fly shop from him, an equal portion oh. um, from him. Uh, so... I didn't even have to think about it. I, I just went home to step into my wife and I said, um, you know, hey, this is like a legitimate opportunity that that this man is giving me. Mm. Um, and you know that this is something I've always wanted and I'm really interested in in the field. I mean, it's retail, right? But it's it, it's shrouded in the sport that I love. Right, yeah. Um, There's passion there. Right, yeah. And um, this is this is what I'm going to do, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, it's, it's interesting to hear that because it sounds so different than like your mental state with the law enforcement where you were just like, yeah, you, you had that, like, it just didn't feel right. And right. Th- I knew and, I wanted to help people and I, this and that, but it just, yeah, it just didn't feel right. The yeah. whole, it just didn't feel right to me. And it sounds like the day that Troy pitches to you or maybe the moment you, it's, it was clear. Like, yeah. you're like, oh, you didn't have hesitation. Yeah. 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 A- a- at least that's that's how I experienced it. Maybe my wife would say differently. <laughs> uh, but I definitely was like, you know, at this, it, this is an opportunity that like, I hadn't been afforded before. And I think it would be silly for me to, to close a door that opened up in this manner. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I went for it. And it took about, oh, I think a a month or so to iron out how everything was going to work and then you set up, set up a different, uh, structure for the, for the business and transfer everything into that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah. And in, in May, so I, would left work to get my hip torn apart basically (laughs) in February. And then in May, um, I was at the fly shop. Wow. Yeah. As a third owner of a fly shop in Corvallis, Oregon. So this was not that long ago. This is probably shortly before, I met you. I'm... Yeah, you came in in the fall after that happened. So it's been about a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, but it's been about a year and a half now. Okay. You know, in that year and a half, man, I got to be honest, like, I feel like I started settling in and getting in this groove. And um, it's kind of, it's it's pretty cool, actually, because, you know, we, we have a point of sale software. We can, you can look at reporting and all that. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I, I can see the fruits of my labor and I can see the fruits of my ideas panning out and working. Um, you know, it, Domino's, it might sound goofy to some people watching, taught me quite a bit. It taught me about upselling. Uh, it taught me about the importance of that. It taught me about like the importance of being really genuine to people. Mm-hmm. And we're doing really good at the fly shop. We're up. That's awesome. um, there's specific areas that I looked at and said, hey, you know, yeah, we always want to try to, you know, f- find these really big sales and sell rods and like, you know, have the, all these these really glorious sales. But, mm-hmm. you know, what do we really sell? Right? It's leaders, flies, tippet. So how do we sell twenty percent more of those? Right? And um, I'm just a really big proponent of just asking, right? Like I've always been asking your customers. Yeah, just asking. Like, hey. Um, you know, do you want do you need leader to tip it or you know they're they're getting flies, right? Let's say they're getting ten flies. Well, 
you need is in in reality you do right like I have them because you you need them you need a size fourteen tan caddis you need a size twelve tan caddis you need a size sixteen tan caddis explain this to people like myself who aren't anglers so the the sizes refer to the physical size of the fly okay. um, the bigger the number the smaller the fly okay. and in nature you know nature is imperfect so you know you'll have a size twelve. Caddis, mm-hmm. and then right next to that real size 12 caddis, you'll have a real size 16 caddis. So, you know, fish sometimes aren't going to eat big bugs, or fish sometimes aren't going to eat small bugs. So you, you in fly fishing, you do what's called matching the hatch. Mm-hmm. Um, so ideally, you would have, if the caddis that day are black, you would have a size 14 black caddis to match the size 14 black caddis that's on the water. Gotcha. So you need that arsenal to mimic yes, whatever right. you're yep. seeing in. Yep. Habitat. And, you know, people come in with the idea of like, oh, I'll get 10 flies, which, you know, that's that's a good number of flies. Frankly, that's a day of fishing. But the reality is, yeah, you'll you'll get these 10 flies, but there's still going to be gaps in there for, for the angler, for the customer. Right. And then the, the business person in me says, well, like, hey, yeah, let's well, like, why not get them to buy 20 percent more flies? You know, sure. why not? Or, or from a single pack of liters to a three pack of liters, like, why not? It it serves them better to have three liters because it's a it's cheaper as a consumer to buy buy them in three packs Mm -hmm. and b take it from me it sucks when your liter is garbage and you only have the one because you only bought the one so it's it's kind of like a twofold thing right like you're you're able to serve the customer well keep in mind that like you know you're a business owner and you have a stake in this and you know it does it does feel good to see those things and be like yeah well actually we did sell over the last year, we did sell 20% more of these and 20% more of those and, mm-hmm. you know, 15% of that just just by asking, right? It's not really a yeah. twisting an arm thing. It's like, hey, like, I think you should have this. Here's why. Do you want it? Right, yeah. yeah. And you're not shrouding it in some shady, like, because no, yeah. it's, like you said, it's serving your customers. Yeah. And, like, you know, you don't want a day of fishing, like, skunked because, yeah. yeah, you've you've ran out of it. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. ran out or you didn't have the right thing. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we see it all the time. Like guys are going to the Bahamas or Alaska, uh, and real trip. Yeah, real trip, and like they, their their gear list is like minimal. Yeah, you know, it's like man, no. If I'm if I'm going to Christmas Island, uh, you know, I'm bringing like a dozen liters with me. Yeah, you want that to be you know a I mean? successful like, I'm, trip. Yeah, I'm not bringing two or three. I'm bringing a dozen, and I'm bringing a dozen because you know if. I whatever break off a couple times or run it past coral uh, and it's it's not smooth anymore and I'm gonna switch it out. I'm not gonna think about it. If my mm-hmm. friend only brought two and he broke off on them, well, guess who has a dozen? Now you can have a couple. You know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah. it, it's it's strange. People spend all this money to go to these on these extravagant trips, but then like <laughs> skimp on ideally. I mean, realistically, rather the the leak, weakest link in their gear. They skip on having like an abundant amount of them to replace. So yeah. and that's probably relatively cheap in comparison to the rest of the cost of the trip. Oh too. yeah, yeah, so, extremely. Yeah, I mean yeah. we're talking like eight ninety five for a liter um, versus uh, seven days in Christmas Islands, probably like fifteen grand, eighteen grand. <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. pretty cheap. Yeah. yeah, you might as why why aren't you spending a little bit more yeah. to insure as an insurance that the trip goes yeah. well? Yeah. yeah. And then I, I think, too, it's also, you know, I, I don't really necessarily know how to pinpoint w- w- what I want to say, but I feel like I'm a lot more salesy, but I sell a lot more things mm. um, in terms of, like, rods and reels. You know, we have pretty high-end rods, um, $1,300 rods, right? And we sold out of them this summer. We got our shipment in, and we we sold out of them. We I, I think I, I, there was one day where I sold six of them on my, up by myself, and it was— wow. People just ask me, like, hey, what do you fish? What is, like, the best one here? And it's like, oh, well, it's it's Berkheimer. That's what you want, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, we I've sold a ton of those, um, and it it feels really good, but it's it's this weird, like, I, I don't know how to explain it, I guess. Like, it's it's just this being, being so genuine and honest to people, I think, is something they're not necessarily always used to in a sales environment. Right. So when they come in to Watershed and it's myself, Troy, or Eli, you know, yeah, I'm an I'm an owner of them, but even as a customer of them, it was always like you always got told the truth, right? And I think there is a value to that. And I, as a salesperson, I'm like, 
not that I've ever lied about things before, but like you can just just tell people, hey, yeah, stay away from any kind of thing, Farbanks thing right now because their warranties are garbage. Like, get this instead, and they really do appreciate that. That's happened several times in the last couple of months. People really appreciate like the knowledge that we have. It's a genuine resource. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, the gen- genuine seems to be the key word yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, and you you can be that, and you don't need to. Yeah, swing and be like, all right, now we're gonna upsell you for right. Yeah, yeah. like like you know, frankly, a lot of the things that we sell, we sell because we like them. It's kind of a bad, you know, we're like bad at business in that perspective <laughs> yeah. because there are better things that we could sell that have a better mar or less lesser things that we could sell that have a better margin. So it'd serve us to sell these lesser quality things financially, theoretically, financially, but, yeah, right. But, but it's the, the customer; it wouldn't serve them. Right. Yeah. So, and at the end of it, it it's it's relationships is what mm-hmm. you're. Yep, we're fostering relationships. You're fostering relationships. We're we're, we're we're this. We're a resource to the community, right? Especially to people who are moving to Corvallis or going to school in Corvallis. Um, that's what we're there for. We're yeah. we're there for the person who has never fished in their life, doesn't know where to go fish, doesn't know how to tie knots, mm-hmm. doesn't know what flies they need, doesn't know what fly line goes to their rod. We're there for that. Yeah. And then, yeah, you know, you, you're genuine and, and kind to people. They're going to come to us instead of going to Amazon. That's right. typically how it's been going, right? Like people are more apt to coming into our store, talking to us, having like an actual analog experience versus buy it now on Amazon and see it in two days. It's right. it's pretty interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems very intentional. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's not, I mean, that's something that Troy has told me from day one, like, hey, this is about relationships. So it has been very intentional, yeah. I'm curious to how the uh, fly shop and the guide part play with each other. Do you see a lot of, like, customers in the fly shop who have become guide customers or vice versa? Yeah, I mean, ideally it's vice versa, right? If someone comes in and has never spent a dime at the fly shop but wants to go on a guided trip, ideally we can convert them from – just being a guide client to being a customer at the shop. Or if someone's a customer at the shop and has never been a guide client, right, it's really good experience for them to be converted to a guide client because they can, you know, everyone's going to scoff at this if anyone fishes and watches this, but, like, we just catch big fish, man. I don't know what to say about it. Like, Troy, Eli, and I just catch donkeys all the time, and people – it's cool to get people into a really big fish. It really is. Like, we're – that's kind of the program that we run is we like to head hunt for fish. We, you know, we can always do a numbers game if people want numbers, but like head hunting for the fish is what we like to do. Um, and yeah, having a client who, I don't know, you know, spent, let's say t- spends $1,500 a year at the shop to get them all, to be a client and then see like, Oh, well, like that's why you want a streamer rod with a streamer line and a really big fly that, you know, is expensive. Let's be honest. You know, there are fourteen dollars flies, mm-hmm. but that's why you'd want that is because you're hunting this fish and you want the right tools to do it, right? So then they, they're a customer. They come on our boat, and then ideally they're like, oh, well now I need a trout spay. Now I need a streamer rod with a streamer line. Uh, you know, uh, now I need uh, a short five weight to do dry dropper fishing with. You know, that's something that they yeah they play hand in hand with each other, and yeah. it, it, it is a goal. And again, it's it's one of those things where it's like. It's almost a transfer of knowledge, especially to the guys that fish a lot already. It, you know, their five hundred fifty dollars kind of goes a long way, man. Like, y- you don't really learn a lot from YouTube. It's a trial and error. Is a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Being on the water is like the only real way to get the experience. Um, so, yeah, it, it can work out pretty well for people. Um, and in, in terms of guiding, you know, it's. I'm my toes are still relatively in the shallow end of the pool uh, in terms of guiding. I I do like it. I I'm enamored with the business side of the shop. Um, mm-hmm. So it's something that's like that's what really, I guess that's what pulls on my heartstrings. Sure. Um, but I, I don't know. You tell me, man. Is there is there a better way to make five hundred dollars than taking people fishing and rowing a boat down the river? You know, it is. It's a pretty cool way to make money. Yeah, it sounds great. In retrospect of. Uh, freezing my butt off in the back of a UPS truck in January, uh, being in 126 degree dominoes in the middle of July, being in a cubicle with people who I thought hated me, like <laughs> being fishing on a raft, rowing it down the river, 
not a bad way to make money. Sure. It's not, it's not a bad, not a bad look. So with, with the guiding, do you have a lot of clients who are repeat, who are coming back routinely, or is it kind of one off who just want to be shown the rope or uh, a one off an experience? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if, so Eli definitely has the, the lay of the land when it comes to guiding. That's you're right. Like I'm enamored with the business side of it. Mm-hmm. He's enamored with the guiding side of it. Gotcha. Um, you know, from from what I see, I think it's about 50-50, right? Like I, every year we have a pretty big influx of people who have never been fishing before ever or who are, haven't been fishing with us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we'll maybe get 10% of them as a recurring client. But, you know, 10%, you know, maybe it's a dozen people a year, you know, but you start repeating that, you know, our, our client list is pretty big of people who are going on at least once, once a year with us. Um, we have a couple of clients who have booked once a month, every month for like the last six months. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have clients who book three or four days in a row with us. Uh, yeah. Garnering like the, the first time or single, client into a repeat one is is a big deal and, and again because it, it does it serves right there's this relationship we can build it's this mm-hmm. knowledge transfer and then it serves the business well as well right to have these people like essentially like you know we're, we're curating loyalty to us right like right. these guys are my guides these guys are my outfitters they know what they're talking about the proof is in the pudding like they they know how to catch big fish and they've showed us how to catch big fish mm-hmm. so yeah like the, ideally it's retaining all that do you see this growing to a point where you would have like more guides and or employees at the shop to help you like scale or do you, what, what is the plan going forward? Yeah. I, I mean, we uh, talk to the guys about like, you know, what, where we want to be in the next couple of years and financially, if we hit this point, does that mean we have, we hire someone on? Cause at the end of the day, it's a retail job, right? Like, right. Yeah. Um, it, again, it's, it's veiled in fishing, but it's a retail job. Someone, especially someone young, right, in Corvallis, is going to want to work at the fly shop. They're going to want to be in the industry. So if we need to find someone, we will. Um, you know, we have people that can help us. We have, like, a crew if we needed a crew. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is it something you, you're targeting? Because, I mean, a core part of your business essentially is that intimacy, that relationships mm-hmm. that you have with your, your your clientele and your customers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you, is that, I'm sure that's a factor in whether if you did scale and grow employees and stuff, whether you would, how you would maintain that or if you would worry about losing it entirely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, you know, it's, I, I'm pretty unique because in, until I owned Watershed, Watershed had been the only fly shop I've had ever stepped foot into. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So I go into other fly shops. I've gone into other fly shops here and there. And I see some of the employees they have working there, and it's like, oh, my goodness, man. Like, I, that's got to be terrible for business, having having someone who just doesn't care at all working for you. That's got to be terrible for business. Yeah. Um, so employees are very – the right employee is pretty elusive. Like, the thought of employees is pretty scary to me, right? Because, like – sure. You know, at large, like, right, Troy built the business originally. It's a huge – his name is all over it, right? And then now – How old is it, by the way? When uh, did you start? Nine years. Nine years, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, his name's all over it, but people people now know who Mark is. People now know who Eli is. And it's – yeah, it's just – it's a worrisome thing to think, like, you're, you're handing over your baby um, to someone who may or may not care about it at all. So, sure. So uh, – it's it's something we've talked about. It's something we're looking at. You know, right now we're not at that point. If we keep growing how we are, we certainly certainly are going to need to hire someone, um, especially with Troy kind of sunsetting. You know, I, I think eventually, you know, it's going to be Eli and I um, it, by design, right? That's I think that's how Troy wanted it. He wanted to provide Eli and I with an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, eventually it's going to be something we have to cross the bridge of. Um and, you know, who knows, like online expansion is pretty difficult because it's a saturated area. But mm-hmm. if we expanded any more online than we are right now, like that'd be a lot of work. Uh, if we physically expanded or open a new location or something that, we, yeah, like employees would have to come into play for sure. Yeah. All things to consider. Yeah. Speaking of your the online element, I know you guys have an e-commerce side. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, how is that kind of a small sliver? How it's a pretty saturated market, and the ones who got in while the getting was good are like the they're the ones everyone goes to. They're mm. the ones that have like their SEO maximized. They're the ones who spent twenty thousand dollars on a website. Um, it's definitely something we're trying to penetrate into more. Like you know, that's been a big project of mine was like revamping our website, and um, it's just tough. It's tough when you're competing with. With Amazon, right, that's probably our number one competitor, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, and then it's even more tough when you're competing with people who are so entrenched in online sales that they they have the volume to, to kind of offset margin so they can do things like give away free fly lines because everything's price locked. So giving away stuff with another thing is – it's really difficult to do for us. Right, because right, it just we're not we're not there volume wise where other people are. So, mm-hmm. um, it's definitely a puzzle that we're trying to figure out for sure. So you guys handle all that yourself. It sounds like there's not you're not a drop shipper. Not a drop shipper. No, yeah, we yeah. handle it all ourselves. You would be surprised at how often people are using small businesses in general get targeted for fraud, um, mm-hmm. and online is a massive window for that. I mean, it's maybe one transaction a week comes in, it's super suspicious, and we're like, uh, yeah, that's not real, right? Like, the zip code doesn't match, this and that, mm-hmm. um, because we've been burned before, right? Like, the person whose identity was stolen, they end up getting the money back, but our $650 fly rod is in someone else's hand. So um, it's that's another thing I never expected dealing with, sure. um, and it's it's a pretty tricky, tricky deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a big problem to solve, especially if, like, the e-commerce isn't that big of part yeah, of your business. Yeah. We're like, well, is that even worth? The, right, exactly. Is it effort? is it even worth it? I mean, I, I, when when we get a good sale online and uh, it's a legitimate one, you know what I mean? Like we have our ways to vet now. In the beginning, it was just like, oh, look, we got someone bought six hundred fifty dollar rod randomly, you know. But when it's a vetted real sale, it does feel really good, man. It feels like great to make a good sale. For more or less when you're when you're sleeping, right? Like you put in all this, it's a huge amount of front loaded work, right. and then to have it kind of trickle in, um, it lets you see the potential for sure. Yeah, and there's a, I mean, everyone knows like there's a massive potential for online stuff. So yeah, I mean, I've I've heard of Amazon that yeah. you mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're doing pretty well. Yeah, do you have an average week like as far as like where your time goes and and uh, how it's spent? Yeah, I mean, so typically wake up, uh, I try to get to the shop between 8.30 and 9.30, depending on what's going on. Um, If I have kind of really more than two things to do, I get there at like 8.30. That way I just have an hour and a half to do those things and not be bothered by customers or deliveries or anything. I have been doing a lot of like inventory management and a lot of like reading like reports from sales and stuff. That's Mm -hmm. what I do to fill my free time there. Um, I might watch a little YouTube here and there too when nothing's going on. I but mean, you're you're an owner, yeah, so you can yeah, you can yeah. get what you want with your time. Yeah, but uh, you know, basically, when a customer's there, you know, it's, it's shoot up and and help them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he, he, a lot of times, you know, we'll have conversations with people for twenty, thirty, forty minutes, and it's a no sale at all. But a lot of the time I'm pretty confident that they're going to come back and, and oftentimes they do come back and it's a $700 sale. Right. So, um, just being there for that and like, you know, being, being the fly shop guy, I guess is what it takes up the most of the day. Right. Like being the guy that has the information that has the knowledge, um, that it takes up a good portion of the day for sure. Yeah, being a resource. Is, yeah, being a resource. That, yeah, that takes a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you know, of course we cleaning and blah blah blah. Right, that's that's all standard. Um, mm-hmm. And then like on a guide day, you know, I'll wake up at six or so, um, get everything into the boat, and then meet clients around seven seven thirty, be on the water by eight, and be off the water three thirty four, be home by five ish or. Oh, be so- at, it's fairly standardized what a fishing day looks like. It's not. Yeah, I mean, typically, much. like, it, it varies with weather and, and heat. Um, you know, in, in the super hot days in July, we will start the days earlier um, so people aren't just cooking at 3.30 in the afternoon, you know. Yeah. Um, 
or in the winter time, it's very dependent on water levels. You know, we have a ton of rain in the winter in the Pacific Northwest. Right. Um, and if the river's too high, there's no point in going fishing it because it's blown out. Or if it's too low, you can't get your boat down it. So it um, there are some some variables. But, stand, you know, standard, yeah. Like it, on a June through July, it's pretty, you know, you you have, you have wake up at 536, get all your stuff together. You meet your clients at 7, 730. You're off the water, 334. Mm-hmm. Um, rinse and repeat, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I got to ask, how does the the work-life balance play? Are you able to actually fish for leisure very much? Well, so this last year, I certainly have fished the least amount I ever have in my life, even like when I was a gear fisherman back in Ohio. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do get a fish. I, it's it's more of a choice thing, right? Like the shop currently is closed Sunday. Um, Sunday, I, I really try hard to spend it with my wife because um, she has Sunday off. She has Saturday, Sunday off. But I definitely would like to fish more. Yeah. yeah. Winter winter time is when I get to do most of my fishing, right? Because the shop's pretty slow. Um, and I like steelhead fishing. Out of out of all the fishing I do, I like steelhead fishing the most. So, and that's um, a, a winter? Generally, it's a summer and a winter run. Okay. Um, so the summer run is happening right now, uh, like in areas like the Rogue and the Deschutes. Um, and then in the wintertime on our coastal river is basically like December until – April, if it's a good run, mm-hmm. um, there'll be fish, winter fish uh, in the coast. Well, it sounds like you're you're pretty passionate about like the work you do. Like you, it sounds like you enjoy it. Uh, yeah. And yeah, maybe it'd just be nice if there was like a bonus eighth day in a week that you could right, get yeah. out. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you seem pretty happy. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, it's um, the shop feels like a greater purpose. If I slack off or if I screw up, we all screw up. You know what I mean? That's what yeah. it feels like to me. So yeah. it's definitely given me some some pretty strong purpose and some pretty good intent with my time when it comes to the shop. Um, and, yeah, I don't think I've – job satisfaction-wise, I don't think I've ever been happier with what I'm doing for, for money. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah. So I, I see a, a, that, like – how you got into the oil stuff when we mentioned earlier, um, that was kind of through like someone else in a way, mm-hmm. like, and you kind of worked to yeah. maybe not directly with people, but kind of within a atmosphere of mm-hmm. friends. And now like you're doing it with a fly fishing shop. I'm curious, do you think you would like, would you have found some of these entrepreneurial things like by yourself and you would like pursue them by yourself or is it more comfortable to, to like, you know, do it with other people and be brought in. I certainly think it's more comfortable to do it with, with like, you know, Eli and I got brought in at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, Troy, he's been an entrepreneur for a while. Um, and yeah, it was definitely, yeah, he, he's my mentor. Right. And it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely a lot easier to do when you have someone that you can say, Hey, like, this is what this person would do. And it was successful for them. Um, so yeah, having a mentor made it, made it much easier. Right. Um, now I do think I probably would have found myself into something, um, eventually Mm -hmm. what it would have been. I don't know. Right. Like flipping mineral rights and fly fishing. Like those are two kind of off the wall things I never saw myself doing, Yeah, but you can make money anywhere in America, man. Like there's so much stuff you can do every, uh, I mean, it's, it's literally almost every day I meet someone coming to the fly shop who does something that I never would have thought of doing. And they make decent money doing it. You know, mm-hmm. we, we have a guy, um, he has a mobile semi-truck washing business. Hmm. That's brilliant. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, these dudes are in their trucks for 12 hours a day or whatever. Why would they want to wash them? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, window cleaning. Like, it's all over the place. Like, things you just wouldn't think of yeah. people are making money off of. So I, I think eventually, yeah, I would have I would have found something. What it was, who knows. But Sure. Well... Hopefully you won't have to deal with that. Or if you do, then yeah, well, you, you will. Yeah, I'm always looking for something. Always looking for a side thing to do. So Yeah, yeah. yeah Troy and I talk about it all the time. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, yeah, because yeah, when you have that entrepreneurial mindset, which you clearly do. That's then, like the next thing. What's the next thing? Yeah. 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 I know that that when you're saying um, not being aware of what might be out there, then you're told about it. I've I've experienced that a lot myself. Yeah. Like, and I, I remember talking to, like, friends when I was younger. And they're like, oh, you know, because some – 
some people know what they want to do. They right. want to be a teacher or whatever, yeah. and that's great. And I, I remember just being like, I don't know what I want to do, but I'll know like when I see it mm-hmm. probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause you just don't, the world is so wide and it becomes more and more so every year Yeah. Uh, with the options. So it's just like, sometimes you just, you go out there and you'll find something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, there's, it's, it's, it's endless. It, I mean, yeah. it's endless. People, people are making a living walking other people's dogs and stuff. You right. Know? Yeah. It's, it's crazy what you can do to earn a living in the U S. Um, yeah. So. And a lot of it's like, if, if you're doing the self-employment stuff, a lot of it's the mindset and the ability to work that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I, yeah. Think. You know, not, not everyone's going to be an inventor, man. Not everyone's going to make the next Amazon or the next Google, right? Like, mm-hmm. Some dudes are just going to polish concrete better than the others, and they're going to make a quarter million dollars a year doing it. Mm-hmm. So, what's wrong with that, man? Like, yeah, you know, I, I applaud those guys, and it's something. Yeah, I'm always looking for something else. Um, like I said, the fly shop, I love it. Uh, I don't ever want to leave it, but you know, who knows if I can do something with my 20 hours of spare time a week that makes a sensible amount of money? Then yeah, why not? Why not? Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is what do you see for the future? But it yeah. sounds like that's that's the answer. I'm always looking. That's the, yeah, that's what looking. I'm always looking like, uh, you know, flipping things has been kind of popping back up on my radar. Um, Cars? Boats. Or boats. Yeah. Okay. Like you know, drift boats and rafts and stuff. Okay. With it, uh, fishing type. Yeah, boats, yeah. 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 And trailers, stuff like fishing, you know, for drift boats and rafts because there's a really strange market for trailers for those. But um, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's kind of on my radar and guiding, you know, that's a side, that's its own side hustle that benefits the shop. Um, that's always there. Um, who knows? Maybe, maybe open a coffee stand or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's there. I'll like, talk to you in a year. We'll yeah, see where exactly. you're at. Yeah. 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 Do you have any other advice other than that that you've already laid down to anyone who's considering uh, Boss's Paths? Yeah. I would say, man, like you'll meet some genuine people in your life and people that you can trust. Um, I would hold those people pretty close to you. Uh, like I, I said a couple of times, Troy gave me a tremendous, tremendous opportunity with this fly shop. Mm-hmm. Um, one that I, you know, it's not a sob story, but frankly, one I had never been afforded by anyone else I had met in my life before. Um, and I took it. So take that for what it is. Like, you know, you, there's people in your life that you know that want to help you. Um, you should... You know, if a door opens, walk through it. Uh, you don't, you know, don't analyze, don't be paralysis. They don't get the analysis paralysis. Just, just do it. What's the worst? You know, what's the worst that could happen? Sure. You gotta work at Domino's. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, no, that's great advice. Thank yeah. you. Mm-hmm. So, how can people find you? Maybe share the address of the shop or website, or or if you have anything on your personal side of things. Yeah. You want yeah. To share. So uh, physically, we're at three fifty one Southwest Madison in Corvallis, Oregon, um, right next to Burst Chocolate. Our website is watershedflyshop dot com. Uh, our social media is all the same. Watershed Fly Shop. Come on in. Yeah. F- give us a call. Our phone number is five four one two zero seven three seven nine zero. Uh, all of us love talking to people. It's it's a curse for all of us. Um, and yeah, even if you have nothing to do with fishing, we'd love to talk to you. So yeah, I mean that's that's how I found you yeah. guys. I walked in the shop. I'm not a an angler myself, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Um, and for guiding, if someone is that all, they would say yeah. Manner. Just contact the shop, uh, yeah. the phone number, or shop at watershedflyshop.com. dot um, And September, you know. The busiest months, if someone's going to book, are May and September. Um, so if you want, at one point, if anyone's watching this future, call sooner than later for those months. But generally, we do book up pretty fast. So calling sooner than later is always really good. All right. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. Well, Mark, this has been great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. It's been great talking with you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. All right. And there you have it. Uh, another fun conversation. Um, if you want to hear more conversations like this with interesting people, then be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Until then, this has been The Boss's Path. Catch you later. Catch you later.